Pikachu is in there. I don't need Pokemon Go. Pikachu! Watch, just watch. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Welcome to Saturday afternoon, throw it up in the air and figure out things as we go along day. Oh, this looks interesting. So we are outside of Yingling Bottling in Tampa, Florida. Literally Bush Gardens is over that way. We saw this the last time we were in town. We wanted to come by and see if we can get on one of the tours one time. Timing worked out. By the way, these are all of the breweries in Tampa Bay, and if you open this up, Whoa. all of these offer tours. 48 of them. Welcome you all to the Yingling Brewery. My name's Elizabeth. I'm going to be your tour guide for about 40 minutes or so. It generally depends on how many questions you have and how quickly you want to get back to your beer sample. So what I recommend you do, don't ask too many questions, we can do it in about 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, everybody. Now, as you're probably aware by now, Yingling is America's oldest brewery. It's been around since 1829. Our founder came over from Germany and set up his business in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and chose this location because he had access to spring water that he could brew the beer with. And also what he did, he carved out caves and tunnels in the mountainside, so it was instant refrigeration. He could store the beer there. The first brewery he had built was called the DG Yingling Eagle Brewery. That is why we have the Eagle logo. Do not confuse this eagle with any other eagle out there. Okay, we're not affiliated with that other company in any way, shape or form. In actual fact, a few years ago, before they got bought out by InBev, they decided they were going to sue us over the eagle. They said we stole it from them. Well, our eagle has been around 30 years longer than theirs. So Mr. Yingling actually had the opportunity to counter sue, but he chose not to. He said he had much better things to do with his money. For a start, he wanted to buy some Clydesdales he could just stick out on the front door now there. I'm <laughs> glad <laughs> some of you got that too. Okay, so we currently have three breweries. We have um, two in Pennsylvania, and we have this one here. This being the largest of the three that we own. This brewery is now, as of two years ago, capable of producing two and a half million barrels of beer a year. Um, so this is why we've been able to open up new markets. Uh, this year, we started out this year opening up uh, the Minnesota, not Minnesota, <laughs> you wish, with the man from Minnesota. Um, what, what starts, what's another state that starts with M? Oh, Mississippi. Mississippi, that's it. Sorry, sorry, I had too many yinglings last night. Um, Mississippi, and we're just currently distributing into Louisiana. And that will possibly be followed by um, Kentucky um, and maybe Arkansas as well, because that's where Walmart's headquarters are. So, yeah, it's pretty market, you know, marketing department sort of that one out. So, but this particular brewery, the portion you see behind the trees here, was built in 1958 by Joseph Schlitz. It was then owned by Strohs, then Pabst owned it. Strohs owned it again. And when Strohs went out of business, Mr. Yingling purchased it in April of 1999. 
he paid about $12 million for this brewery. We have 52 acres of land. The neat thing was he called back the Stroh's employees who had lost their jobs. So the majority of the gentlemen that work here are former Stroh's employees. And we do have some that date back to the Schlitz days as well. I think we've got actually one of them left. The others, I don't know, they're all gone now. Um, we did get one guy from Miller and one from Budweiser, but those two are still in the basement. We haven't let them out yet. So. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, let's go over to the brewery. You can take photos anywhere on the tour route. I will tell you today, unfortunately, there is no production. So if you want to turn around now and leave, you, you can. <laughs> get your money back at the end of the tour. Um, but yeah, because of that, we'll give you three samples today rather than two. Okay? Okay. All right, does that sound good? All right. Okay, let's, let's go. We can play Pokemon while we're on tour. This tour group is huge today. There's probably like 60 people on this thing. It's free. <coughs> three free beers. Oh, it's the secret room. Okay. Okay, so as I say, this is our new brew house. This is the, the brew house that's responsible for our increasing capacity and the, has given us the ability to open up new markets. Now, before we get to this stage, what happens is the barley that we use comes from the Midwest, either Minnesota, some of it comes from Canada as well. It comes directly into the brewery on rail cars. When the rail cars get here, we attach a hose to the bottom of the rail cars and then we use compressed air to take the barley up into the silos so it's ready to be used. From the silos, it goes to the mill where we grind up that barley and we mix it with water. And it goes into what we call our mash tub. Now, the mash tub is the tub you see in front of us here. Now, the barley is cooked in there for 30 minutes with water. Now, whilst that's cooking in that mash tub, we've got corn grits cooking in the tub you see to the rear. So they're cooked for 30 minutes separately and then 30 minutes together in the mash tub. When the temperature gets up to 156 degrees, which is the starch sugar conversion temperature, then all the ingredients converge into this big machine in the middle. This is what we call the louder tub. This is set up basically just like a colander. So what it does, it separates the grain from the liquid. As the liquid and the grain flow through there, the grain is captured, the liquid portion then ends up in the brew kettles, which you see to the left. Now, whilst the grain is still in there, though, we run more water through there, which we call sparge water. So it's more or less like dipping a tea bag twice to get as much flavor out of the grain as possible. So we've got all the liquid in the brew kettle. The spent grain we sell as cattle feed and worm feed. We don't waste anything in this industry. Even the diatomaceous earth that we use to filter our beer, we give to asphalt companies and they can use it on the roads. So we've got all our liquid in the brew kettles and these brew kettles hold 755 barrels. There are 31 gallons to a barrel when you're talking about beer and not oil, okay? By the time we finish brewing, which takes about three and a half hours and the temperature in the brew kettles got up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, then we do lose a certain amount of barrelage in steam. But it's at this point we add all our other ingredients. We add hops. And the hops we get from the Yakima Valley in Upper Washington State. We add hops, we add corn, obviously the corn grits are already in there. Uh, we add some vitamins for the yeast, and we add a water stabilizer. The water in Florida, as you're probably aware, is pretty nasty. Okay, so we have to try and make it perfect for brewing. And we do this by adding what we call Burtonizing salts which get their name from a place in England called Burton-on-Trent, which supposedly has the best brewing water in the world. If you've ever drank, um, what is it, Bass, Bass Ale? Have you ever had Bass? That's where it originates from, okay. All right, so we've got all our ingredients staying there, cooking and brewing away for about three and a half hours. Now these brew kettles are pretty unique in so much that they not only brew the beer, but they're set up like a centrifuge as well. We call this process thermosiphoning, but what happens is all the liquid gets spun around. Any solids that are still left in that liquid that haven't been separated in the louder ton will then sink to the bottom of the tank. So we can decanter the clear liquid off from the top. What we have left at the bottom is called true, and we sell that as cattle feed and worm feed as well. Okay. All right, any questions? No, you know better. You're not going to get your samples if you keep asking. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no engineers on tour today, hopefully. <laughs> 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 so, while those were questions in 1958, and you can see that the 
track comes right in here with the supplies. The time and it is the job of the brewmaster to order all the supplies. Um, now the silos when Schlitz owned the brewery were painted like Schlitz beer cans, so it's like an eight pack of Schlitz. Now the building to the right here or directly in front of you folks here is the powerhouse which is responsible for pumping water around the farm, production of steam and refrigeration. And incidentally the water we use here is not city water, it comes from wells that we have on the property. Each one of our wells is 277 feet deep. So the water comes directly from the Florida aquifers. If we were to use city water, our bills would be outrageous and expensive. Yeah. Now, the land uh, that the brewery's on now used to be an airfield. It was called Henderson Airfield. They used to train pilots during World War II to fly from here. So there are still some landing strips in this area. Hey, it's somebody's office. I want to work here. This is the brew lab. so much easier because you have to remember two names but they come in here at three o'clock every morning not today they get Saturdays off they come in at three because the bar over the street kicks them out around 2 45 <laughs> but the first thing they do when they come in here is go to the finished beer tanks and taste the beer in the tanks before it gets pumped out to the filler they have to taste and test every brew and every time it moves from one tank to another and it does go through a series of tanks in the 23 days minimum it takes to come up with the finished product. So this includes beer in fermentation, which is about five to six days, and then the aging process, which is about two to three weeks. But they will check the grain when it comes in, packaging going out, and everything in between. They do microbiology studies here. We are checking to make sure the brewers are doing their housekeeping correctly, and that there aren't certain types of bacteria that can alter the taste of the beer, okay? None of these bacteria are harmful. There is nothing harmful grows in beer. The pH of beer is only four, it's acidic, so you're not gonna get salmonella growing in it, listeria or anything like that. The only way beer is gonna make you violently ill is 
but you all know how that happens. Yeah. <laughs> so don't bother writing in like the students from USF do periodically. I don't know why I'm looking at you, it's just because you're wearing that USF thing. Um, and saying, you know, there was something wrong with your beer because I was throwing up all day Sunday, okay? You're not going to get a keychain out of us for that. If you do have a genuine complaint though, there are a series of numbers on the neck of each bottle and the base of each can which will identify the beer. It will tell us and tell you exactly where that beer came from and how old it is. We keep a library of every brew that's left this facility for up to six months. So if we get a complaint come in, we can actually pull those samples and see what the problem is. And I'll show you how to read that on the cans when we get back to the hospitality center. Do remind me to do that because I always forget. Okay. So um, we do taste testing. We do weekly taste testing. And this will consist of tasting beer that's been out in the market for say 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. We want to see what the consumer's tasting after that amount of time. And then we do a monthly taste test whereby we are tasting the beer from Pennsylvania. They in turn taste our beer. We are trying to maintain that consistency between the three breweries. Okay. Anyway, okay, so. All right, so these are the hops we use, okay? These are pelletized hops, okay? We use these because they last a lot longer than regular hops. Regular hops look like that picture at the back there behind the lady with the striped shirt on, okay? And we do have some plastic ones on that thing there too. They, we try to make them look authentic by sticking them in a pot of soil, but it doesn't fool too many people. But that's what, that's what hops look like. And as I told you earlier, we do get our hops, excuse me, our hops um, from the, the Yakima Valley in Upper Washington State. That's with the exception of the hops we get for our Oktoberfest. We get those hops from Germany as well as the barley. And some of the hops we use for our IPL, which is one of our seasonal beers, um, we get from England as well. So, and this is the barley, okay? This looks like kind of coffee, okay? It's because it's been dark roasted. Um, all the barley comes in ready roasted, ready malted. All we have to do is grind it up and mix it with water. Okay. Now, so looking at those hops over there, those plastic ones, is there anybody here that can tell me the closest relative to the hop plant? Does anybody know what it is? Basil, did somebody say that? Is it marijuana? <laughs> Which pothead said that? <laughs> no, it's, it's actually marijuana. You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it does. Look, oh, it looks like him. We got two of them. Okay, so yeah, it's actually. Uh, <laughs> no, we, no, we don't. In actual fact, you know, uh, unlike marijuana, that does not contain THC, so you can't get high on it. I tried. It doesn't. <laughs> okay. Here's production, but they're closed today, so we don't get to see it in action. <laughs> all right, can everybody see it in the window? There really isn't much to see because it's all pitch black out there. But um, if you if you look in the middle of the floor, those of you that are lucky enough to see out the window, um, in the middle of the floor there is a carousel. It's behind the grey screens. The grey screens are there to reduce the noise because it does get very noisy on the floor. So that is an OSHA requirement. Mm -hmm. That bottle filler, when it's running, fills 900 bottles a minute. Wow. Now we do have a can filler as well, which is situated at about one o'clock from where I'm standing, um, up underneath those yellow steps, and that can fill, that fills a thousand cans a minute. Mm. Now beyond both of these fillers, we have rinses. We rinse both our cans and bottles before they get filled. Once they're filled almost instantaneously, the caps go on or the lids go on. Before the caps go on the bottles though, what happens is there's a high-powered plate of water, it's the size of a pinhead, gets shot into the top of the bottle which will aggravate the beer, make it foam up and it gets rid of any excess air that may be in there. If you get too much air in your bottles or your cans, your beer will taste like paper, it gets oxidized, so we want to get rid of as much as we can. In the case of the cans, we inject CO2 across the top and this has the same effect. 
This CO2 has been reclaimed from the fermentation process. Our powerhouse takes that CO2, they clean it, they compress it, then we can use it at the end of the end of the, the brewing process for more carbonation and also to um, to get rid of air in tanks, not as well as the cans. So the bubbles come off of the filler, they've got the caps on, the first metal box they come to beyond that capper is the machine that puts the numbers on the neck of the bottle. Then they continue, they come around the curve and they go under two bridges and ordinarily you'd see water dripping out of the bottom. This is basically just like a car wash, it washes all the excess beer off of the outside the bottles and gets underneath the caps to prevent the caps from going rusty. Then the bottles continue underneath another bridge. You can probably can't see that, but there's like two little red lines there. There's a ta metal table with a dumpster underneath. And that bridge is an x-ray machine that will detect whether the bottles are filled to the correct level or not. If they're not filled correctly or the caps are not on properly, they get kicked off the line. If you don't put 12 fluid ounces in that bottle and the label says you have 12 fluid ounces, you're mislabeling. You'll have the ATF after you. The rest of the bottles go into the pasteurizer, which is this big rectangular machine with the pipes coming out the side. Bottles and cans are pasteurized, keg beer is not. That is why kegs have to be refrigerated. The shelf life of a keg is 60 days. For bottles and cans, we say 120 days. Um, we do have a keg room here, and that is off limits to the tour, so you're not missing that today. Nobody ever gets to see that. Um, but in 1999, when Mr. Yingling first purchased this brewery, we were filling 500 kegs a week. Now we're filling 450 an hour. Okay, so we've come a long way. Yeah, there's a lot of people drinking a lot of beer out there. During the amount of beer that was going into the tanks, and they would tax you on that. Now they only tax you on what goes out the door. Now each one of the tanks in there holds 1160 barrels of beer. Then that starts there. Oh, that's tight. I always wondered that. It's crazy. That's cool. It's just a, a round of discs. That's tight. And now the line for free beer. You can choose from any Guinness beer that they have out here. Yingling Light, Oktoberfest, Black and Tan, The Porter, regular Yingling. Uh, I'm going to try the Oktoberfest. I got an Oktoberfest and a Porter. The Oktoberfest is in stores next week. I asked if they'd ever do a pumpkin beer and the answer was that Mr. Yingling is too traditional and would never do something like that. I felt like I was scolded like a school kid, so. All right, we are wrapping up here at Yingling Brewery, so on that note, thank you for all of your likes, thank you for your comments, thank you for your subscriptions, treat others the way you want to be treated. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you guys later. Bye.